So it's 8 p.m. on the East Coast of the United States. Let's get started with tonight's Internet Bible Study. This is Chip Brogdon at the School of Christ. .org, welcoming you to the series of teachings from 1 Corinthians. Tonight we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So I hope you brought your Bible. And if you would please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We'll get started there in just one moment. First, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And whatever issues you may be concerned about, whatever you might have encountered during the day today, let's put all that behind us and Open our hearts, open our minds to what the Lord wants to show us tonight, and let's make our requests known to him. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together in your name and to search the scriptures, because your word is life, and your word is light, and your word is truth. So Lord, lead us and guide us tonight as we look into the pages of your word that we would be instructed in spiritual wisdom, that we would receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of your Son, that Christ would be increased even as we are decreased, even as we embrace the cross and follow after him, that your purpose and your will and your kingdom would come and be established and be fulfilled in us on earth as it is in heaven. The great purpose that you purposed in yourself from the foundation of the world, that you would gather together in one all things in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth, even in him. So Lord, I pray tonight and I thank you for those who have joined us. And I pray that you would meet every need according to, to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus, in whom and through whom we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. So I thank you that the anointing that you have given us, abides in us, lives in us, and that anointing is Christ. As we live and move and have our being in him, that we would produce fruit, abundance of fruit, and that our fruit would remain. So we thank you for the gift of Christ, and we thank you for the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that you would fill us with your Spirit and give us eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit wants to say to us. I pray, Lord, every spiritual, emotional, physical, financial need would be met, that every care that we have would be cast upon you as we take this time away from family and friends, away from the cares of this world, to gather around the study of your word. Now let it be more than a teaching, but let it be life, and let it be transformational to us. Not just informational, but transformational. And I thank you for the bond of the Spirit, that we are one body in Christ. Wherever we are gathered from, I thank you that Though we are separated by distance, we are yet one in the Spirit. So I bless you and I praise you for the body of Christ tonight, of which we are a part. May you be glorified in everything that is said and done and taught tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. If you are in agreement, say amen. Type amen into your question box. That serves as a point of agreement as well as a bit of a sound check to make sure that I'm getting through loud and clear. Wonderful. So tonight we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Before we get started, of course, I want to say thank you for being here, taking the time out of your schedule to log in and be a part of the study tonight, and also for supporting the School of Christ with your prayers and with your finances as the Lord enables you and as the Lord leads you. We appreciate that, and that's how we're able to make these things available without cost. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and tonight we're, we are going to divide it up into three sections and discuss each of these three. If you're new to the webinar, the way it works is I'll give a presentation and at the end of the presentation, I'll open it up for your questions, and we'll have a question and 
answer session. If you have any questions or comments, just hang on to those until the end of the teaching because you might find your question is answered in the middle of the teaching. And um, I'm pretty smart, but I'm not very good at multitasking. So if I'm reading questions and comments while I'm teaching, eventually I'm going to uh, lose track of where I am and it won't be a, a pretty sight. <laughs> So I do that in the live teaching, too. I, I ask people to write down their questions, and then I say what needs to be said, and then I open it up, and we have a good discussion afterwards. But um, that's the best way I have found to keep myself on track, so that's that seems to be the best thing to work here. So with that in mind, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we'll look at these three sections tonight. Number one, Christ crucified. Number two, the hidden wisdom, and number three, spiritual discernment. So having said that, let's get right into the Word of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, why would Paul come to them and say, I'm only going to teach you one thing, and that's Jesus Christ and him crucified. I'm only going to know one thing among you, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, because that is the foundation of everything that God wishes to reveal to us. God has no revelation or anything that he wishes to impart to, uh, impart to us outside of Christ. So get that very clear. Write that down in your notes if you're taking notes, that God has no revelation that he wishes to impart to us outside of, separated from Christ himself. In him, in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead in a body. And you are complete in him, it says in Colossians chapter 2. So everything that God would reveal and everything that God would say to us, he is going to reveal and say and show us one way or the other by and through Christ Jesus. He has blessed us, it says in Ephesians 1.3, with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It says in Hebrews chapter 1 that God in, in different times and in different ways spoke to the fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. So everything that God has done, everything that God is doing, and everything that God will do is one way or the other connected to Christ. That's why at the school of Christ, our motto or our credo if you will is christ-centered teaching for christ-centered living that's the only kind of teaching and living that matters in the kingdom of god everything that god is doing and everything that the holy spirit is trying to reveal to us he is trying to get us to be christ-centered now we start out self-centered why did you get saved mostly for self-centered reasons because you didn't want to go to hell, you wanted to go to heaven. Well, that's all right, I guess, as a beginning step. But just understand that's very self-centered. And that's probably the way that religion made the invitation to you in a very self-centered self -centered way. That you certainly don't want to die tonight and not know if you're going to go to heaven. You certainly don't want to die tonight having not received Jesus as your personal Savior, and go to hell. So wouldn't you like just to go ahead and pray the sinner's prayer? And people will raise their hand, and they'll say, yes. 
I'm not going to say whether that's right or whether that's wrong. I'm just going to make the observation that that kind of an invitation and that kind of a response is a very self-centered invitation and response. It is not a Christ-centered invitation and response. Because if we were really to invite people to live a Christ-centered life instead of a self-centered life, many of them would not respond to that kind of an invitation. And yet that is precisely the kind of invitation that Jesus gives to his disciples. If anyone would be my disciple, let him come to me, deny himself, take up his cross, and follow after me. That is a calling to live a Christ-centered life by taking up the cross, denying the self-centered life. That's all discipleship is. It is learning how to give up your self-centeredness and how to embrace Christ-centeredness. So, to newborn babes in Christ, to those who are still carnal, meaning they are not yet spiritual, we don't need to teach them anything. We don't need to preach anything to them apart from the very basic, fundamental, elemental truth of Christ and him crucified. If you don't understand that, if you don't know what it means to be Christ-centered, if you don't understand the cross and what it means to take up the cross, Jesus says you're not worthy to be my disciple. Now, religion will accept anyone. They'll accept anybody who raises their hand or prays the prayer or walks the aisle or signs the decision card. But an easy gospel gets easy disciples who follow after an easy Jesus, but then they fall away as soon as persecution comes because of the word. And so they fall away. Jesus says they become offended and they fall away. So Jesus would rather you count the cost and make sure that you really want to follow him rather than be offended down the road. And there's great wisdom in that approach. I like that approach. I don't want to waste time with people who are going to get offended with me six months from now. I'm not in the Christian entertainment business. I used to be. Did you know I used to be in the Christian entertainment business? By that I mean I used to lead worship in church, and I used to preach in church. That's just as much the Christian entertainment business as any Christian recording artist or singer or songwriter is in the Christian entertainment business. The whole religious system is in the Christian entertainment business. It's not in growing disciples of Jesus. It's not in getting people into a spiritually mature walk with God. It's not trying to get people into a Christ-centered relationship with him. It's about to entertain and to tickle the ears. This is what Scripture teaches will be the case in the last days. People will heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, ever learning, but never coming to the experiential knowledge of the truth. So when you're dealing with newborn babes, when you're dealing with carnal Christians who have not yet grown spiritually, we can't talk about anything until we get them established on Jesus Christ and him crucified. So that's why Paul says, I determine not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Well, Brother Chip, we want to hear about spiritual gifts. We want to hear about house church. We want to hear about these other things. Well, I can't talk to you about those other things until we get these basic fundamental truths down pat. Well, I understand what you're saying, Brother Chip, because you've been teaching it this way for 15 years, and now it's time to move on to something else. No, it's time for you to move on to something else. If you're not satisfied with a Christ-centered teaching, because what you don't understand is everything is based upon that. Spiritual discernment, it's based upon being Christ-centered. Spiritual gifts, it's based upon how centered upon Christ are you. 
spiritual fruit based upon how Christ-centered you are. Well, what about body ministry? What about body life? What about fellowship? First, you must understand that you are called, it says in 1 Corinthians 1, 9, we read it last week, he has called us into the fellowship of his son. If you're not in fellowship with the head, how in the world can you appreciate fellowship with members of the body? So it's not that God isn't going to lead us and teach us into these other things, but the point being, we've got to have this foundation in place. And that's why Paul says, I determine not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He didn't give them a systematic theology. He didn't say, now there's 28 basic lessons you need to learn in the Christian life. And try to give them an entire seminar on all the different teachings and doctrines that you would learn in a seminary someplace. He says, no, if you don't get this, if you don't grasp this, I can't go any further than this with you. So he says, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Lots of things Jesus would like to teach us. Lots of things Jesus would like to share with us. Deeper truths that Jesus would like to lead us into. But he told his disciples, I have many things to share with you, but you can't bear them now. You can't bear them. You can't handle it. And we'll see when we get to chapter 3. Paul says, I wanted to speak to you as spiritual people, but I couldn't. Other things I wanted, I needed to share with you, other depths that we needed to explore, move on to maturity. But you're still babes. You're still carnal. You haven't grown. You're still self-centered instead of Christ-centered. Does this make sense to anyone besides me? So verse 3, Paul says, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So let's look at this section again, and let's make some points. And all the points just came up on the screen all at once, but that's fine. Point number one, the message of the cross is demonstrated in the weakness of the messenger. You see, the messenger of the cross just doesn't bring you a teaching about the cross. But they demonstrate the cross in their own, in their selves. Paul says, I was with you in weakness. Now, We've learned that one of the four core principles of the cross of this hidden wisdom is strength that comes out of weakness. So Paul says, I didn't come to you in strength, I came to you in weakness. To demonstrate the power of God shows up best in weak people. I didn't come to you with excellency of speech because I'm trying to demonstrate that the foolishness of the cross is greater than the wisdom of man. And out of this foolishness comes this sublime, spiritual, heavenly wisdom. So the message of the cross is demonstrated in the weakness of the messenger. It's in the things that we go through that we demonstrate the power of the cross. Now, a lot of people don't understand what the totality of the cross really means. They only think of the cross in terms of the cross that Jesus died on for my sins and for the sins of the world. So for them, the cross is something that happened 2,000 years ago. And while it was historically an event that happened 2,000 years ago with the crucifixion of Christ, Paul's message was Christ-centered and it was based not on 
or not merely on the cross that Jesus died on, but his message of the cross is based on the twofold work of the cross. The twofold work of the cross, meaning that this cross is a prophetic double entendre, which means there is two meanings, two works. And most people who are believers in Jesus, whether they are faithful disciples of Jesus or not, if they are believers in Jesus, they've heard the gospel story, they know about Jesus being crucified. But that wasn't the substance of everything Paul meant when he talked about the cross. Because there is a twofold work of the cross, and I want to illustrate it for you here tonight. Now, I've written about it in my book, Embrace the Cross. We've talked about it in the online discipleship course, Embrace the Cross. It's in different teachings and different articles, but I want to review it with you here tonight so that you understand the twofold work of the cross. Well, it helps to understand it the same way Jesus taught discipleship as a gate and a path. A gate and a path. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to salvation, and few there be that find it. So you have a gate and a path. Now what is the difference? Well, the gate only takes a moment to enter in. It only takes a second to pass through the gate. You open up the gate, you walk through it, piece of cake. So you're through the gate in a moment. And in fact, that's where most Christians are. They enter into the gate to be saved, and then they pitch their, tit, their tent just inside the narrow gate and say, well, hallelujah, I'm saved. But Jesus taught that beyond the straight gate, and it means the, the narrow gate, the difficult gate, Beyond that gate, there is a path. Now, a path doesn't suggest something that is over and done with, but a path suggests a journey. We must travel this path, and the destination is where? Is the destination at the beginning of the path, or is the destination at the end of the path? Well, the path is intended to get us from point A to point B. So the implication is it only takes a moment to go through the gate, but beyond that gate is a path towards Christ-centered living. And that is what it means to be a disciple. And this path represents our spiritual growth and maturity. It represents our journey. So entering into the gate doesn't mean that we can settle down, make camp right there next to the gate and say, well, hallelujah, I've arrived. No, my friend, you've only begun. You've only begun the journey. The gate is at the beginning of the path. It's not at the end of the path. It's not like you walk the path, and you walk the path, and you struggle and strain, you get to the end, and then there's the pearly gates, and St. Peter opens the gate, and you're into heaven. That's the way the world pictures it. Jesus said, no, it's, it begins with a gate. You enter into the gate in a moment, but the path is a journey. A journey towards what? A journey towards Christ-centered spiritual maturity, and it represents growth. So this is why even though Jesus died on the cross, yet there is a cross that we take up and follow after him with. So let's look at the difference. This is the twofold work of the cross. Well, Jesus died for me on the cross. That's one side of it. On the other side, Jesus died as me. Jesus died for me, that's true. 
But the way Paul taught it, Jesus died as me. We are identified with him. I am or I was crucified with Christ. He didn't just die for me. He died as me. I am crucified with Christ. Paul tells us in Romans 6, Romans 8, if we died with him, then we will also be raised with him. In the likeness of his death, we'll be raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Jesus died for me. That's wonderful. Jesus died as me. Well, the first work of the cross, Jesus took up the cross for me, right? He took it up for me. He took it up for you. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world. He took up the cross for me. Well, the discipleship cross is what I take up for him. One time he had large crowds of people following him. And Jesus says, wait a minute. Unless you deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow after me, you can't be my disciple. Can't be. Another place he says, if you're not willing to take up the cross and follow after me, you're not worthy of me. Wow. When's the last time you heard a sermon on that? You're not worthy of Jesus. Well, I thought Jesus loved everybody. Well, sure he loves everybody. But everyone is not worthy of him. Everyone is not able to be his disciple. They're not willing to count the, the, the cost. He says, think about it before you... Say that you'll follow me and do whatever, count the cost. So yes, the cross represents that which Jesus took up for on my behalf, but then there is the other side of the cross that I take up for him. Now, thankfully, the cross that Jesus took up for me, he took up once and for all. Once and for all, the ultimate sacrifice. That's why we don't make animal sacrifices and we don't do the sacrifices and the feasts of the Old Testament because the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus once and for all offered up himself as a sacrifice for sin. Once and for all. That's it. When he said it is finished, he meant that's it. Once and for all. He took upon himself the sins of the world. He doesn't have to be crucified over and over and over again. So once and for all time and for all people, Jesus died on the cross. But there's the twofold work of the cross. And so while it is true that Jesus died once for all time on his cross, it is also true that in order to be his disciple, I have to take up the cross daily. Daily. You see the difference here between the gate and the path? Because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can all enter in through the gate. But on the other side of that gate is a path, and that path is discipleship. And that says, take up the cross daily and follow after me. Paul says, we die daily that the life of the Lord would be manifest in us. We want the life. If we want the life, we have to embrace the cross. That's the principle of the cross. Life that comes out of death. You've got to pass through the death. You want the resurrection? You've got to have the crucifixion. You want the power of God? You've got to have the weakness in yourself. You want the wisdom, the hidden wisdom, the spiritual wisdom? You've got to be like a fool. Meaning, you have to step out on faith. You have to believe what you cannot see. Jesus says to his disciples, you believe because you have seen. Blessed are they who believe, having never seen. Well, that requires a certain amount of foolishness in the eyes of the world. And that's part of the cross that we take up on a daily basis. I die daily. That the life of the Lord would be manifest in me. And so finally we see that the work of the cross on the one hand is for salvation but that's not the end 
And really, honestly, that's all that religion cares about, the salvation, or what they believe is salvation. Eternal life insurance. But do you know, salvation, according to Scripture, is more pervasive. It goes farther than just deciding and determining where you will spend eternity. But salvation, according to Scripture, is complete and total and full deliverance from sin, yes, but also from self. And in order to be delivered from yourself, <laughs> you've got to apply the twofold work of the cross, not just salvation, but discipleship. Now, when you look at these two side by side, does it make sense for you? The gate and the path. You say, well, brother, I received the Lord Jesus on September the 1st, 1965. Well, that's great. That was the gate. What have you done since then? How are you coming along in your discipleship? Do you just see the cross as something that Jesus died on for you? once and for all, to get your salvation? Or do you see the cross as a principle in your life, taking it up for him on a daily basis, learning, growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus, making progress down that path of spiritual growth and maturity? You say, well, brother, I just leave that up to the Lord. If he wants me to grow, then I'll grow. If not, then I don't think I should put forth any effort whatsoever. Well, then the Bible calls you an unprofitable, unfaithful, lazy servant who just takes what he's been given and buries it in the ground because he's too lazy to put forth any effort to grow, to increase in wisdom and knowledge and understanding. It says that Jesus, Jesus, the Son of God, grew in, in favor with God and with man. Jesus grew. Jesus put forth some effort. He knew the scriptures, and he grew. Everything that's living grows. If you're not growing, you're dying. That's the same thing in business. If your business is not growing, your business is dying. There's no constancy in life. Life is always growing and pro progressing. So if you can't see that you're making any progress, then guess what? You're dying. That's what the Corinthians, they, they were boasting in their wisdom and boasting in their spiritual gifts and boasting in all the people that they were following around. I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Paul says, you haven't grown a bit. You've not grown. You're babies. I fed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't able to receive it. Even now, you're still not able. What's your problem? You should be growing. It's been three years. You say, well, brother, when you talk like that, it just puts me under condemnation. No, it doesn't. It just, it's just telling you the truth. There's no condemnation to those that are in Christ, but if you're in the flesh and you're carnal, you're condemning yourself. It's not me. It's not the scripture. You've condemned yourself. If you sow to the flesh, you will reap of the flesh corruption. But if you sow to the spirit, you'll reap of the spirit eternal life. Sowing and reaping. Well, there's some labor involved there. Sowing and reaping. You plant, you water, God gives the increase, but you've got to put some seed in the ground. You've got to do some things. And people say, well, I want the heat, but I don't want to put the wood in. No, you've got to put the wood in to get the heat. People say, I want a 100-fold return with no effort, just God to bless me. Well, that's not how it works. You don't get a return on investment unless you make an investment. I want all the fruit, and I want all the harvest, but I don't want to do the planting and the taking care of the garden. Somebody else can do that, and then I'll just come along and pull out the, eat what, whatever the harvest brings forth that I haven't even labored for, I haven't even worked for. It's not the way it works. 
That's what lazy, unprofitable servants say. That's, what, that's not what children of God say. That's not what disciples of Jesus say. So count the costs, he says. That's the twofold work of the cross. And he says, I can't go any further with you because you've not grasped the very basics. However, he says in verse 6, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. Everyone say mature. We speak wisdom among those who are mature. But what do you speak among those who are immature? Christ and him crucified. Until you get that lesson, we can't speak anything beyond that. We speak wisdom among those who are mature. Those who are immature, we keep speaking Christ and him crucified. Now, you never do get away from that message, no matter how far advanced you get. But the point is, you can't grasp anything else that God wants to show you until you grasp that, until you experience that, until you live that. Until you at least get a glimpse of it and you see the importance of it. And that's the biggest challenge with this generation following after teachings and following after movements and following after personalities and Christian entertainers, and they're into a thousand and one different doctrines and teachings and subjects, getting further and further away from a Christ-centered path into a self-centered or a church-centered path that is just a dead end. It leads nowhere. So we speak wisdom, he says, among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Well, there's just so much there. Let's dig right into it and make some points here. Number one, he says that we speak wisdom among those who are perfect, King James Version says. The word perfect there means mature. New King James Version helps us out there because a lot of people read that, they see perfect, they see perfection, and they're thinking sinless perfection. And it's just a lack of understanding that makes people think they can't make a mistake. And if they stumble or fall or make a mistake or, or do the wrong thing, God is waiting to strike them with lightning because he demands perfection. Well, it's not perfection in the sense that you never make a mistake. If that's the case. None of us would achieve it. But the goal of this age is spiritual maturity. And even those who are spiritually mature can make mistakes. Spiritual maturity simply means that we have grown beyond self-centeredness and we are Christ-centered and therefore more interested in meeting the needs of other people than in meeting our own needs. Our reason for being, our purpose for, live, for living expands beyond what we hope to receive, what we hope to get, what we hope to 
obtain for ourselves, and we're able, because we are fully satisfied and mature, we are able in Christ to begin to truly give and lay down our life and minister to the needs of other people. There is an abundance that we can give away. That's what spiritual maturity is all about. So you, it, you see it follows the same path as a physical growth and maturity. When babies are born, they're totally self-centered. They live in a world of their own. And if you don't give them what they want and what they need, they simply cry until someone meets their needs. They don't have the capacity to meet the needs of other people. Now, the way it's posed work, in the process of growth, that baby grows up to become an adult. And then as an adult, that adult is able to procreate, recreate life, raise up children, and be able to supply the needs of their children. Well, that's quite a difference from when they started out in a self-centered world where their only thought was getting their needs met and they didn't have the capacity to love or care or provide or do anything for anyone else. Now, that's the way it's supposed to work. And when you see a dysfunctional family, what you see is adults behaving like children. Adults who are supposed to be taking care of one another and taking care of their children, instead, they behave like infants. And so the children suffer because the parents never learn what it means to be an adult. They never matured. They still put their needs before the needs of their kids. And so they become bad parents. But that's the root of it, self-centeredness. So I'm just saying, spiritually speaking, there is a parallel. When we begin in Christ, we are babes. We are primarily concerned with getting our needs met. But if we are following after the Lord and we are growing spiritually and we're really, a, really abiding in Christ and really drawing from him and learning and growing, there is an abundance. He anoints my head with oil and my cup overflows and I can't contain the overflow. And out of my belly flows rivers of living water. It's more than I can contain. It's more than I need. So I'm giving it away. That's spiritual maturity. Spiritual immaturity is when's the next church service? When's the next revival? Where's the next big move of God? Oh, brother, we're just praying and we're waiting for revival, waiting for God to send revival. Oh, Lord, revive us. That's not abundance. That's a poverty mentality. I'm weak and feeble, and I can hardly get from one day to the next, can hardly get from one church service to the next. What in the world am I going to do? And I've got to get a church to fill up my gas tank so I can make it through the next seven days. That's a poverty spirit. It's a poverty mentality. He anoints my head with oil, and my cup overflows. Rivers of living water, overflowing, more than enough, more than I need. That's abundance, more than what I need, way more than what I need. Why would God give someone that kind of an abundance? Why would God ever give someone more than what they need? Why? So they can give it away. That's spiritual maturity. There's two kinds of people in this world, givers and takers. Most people are takers. I challenge you to be a giver. Be a giver. Give and give and give and give and begin to experience the abundance and the overflow of the Lord. No, I'm not necessarily talking about money, but everything is connected. We'll talk about money one of these days, and I'll show you how everything is connected. If you've got a problem with money, 
It's not about money. It's about something else. We'll talk about that one of these days. Right now, I'm not necessarily talking about money. I'm talking about giving your life. Giving away. Laying down your life. Serving others. Now, I will say that you can give and give and give and give past the point where you have abundance. And what does that end up resulting in? It results in burnout. That's not the river of life that's overflowing. That's you with a Martha mentality, busy much serving and vexing yourself. That's not the same thing. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a life of the Lord that's bigger than you, bigger than your weakness, and even in your weakness, you're able to give. Even in your lack, you're able to meet the needs of other people. Because it's not you, it is Christ in you. Well, that's a spiritual mystery, isn't it? But that's for those who are mature. Now, if you're not mature, then I say, get all you can get. <laughs> Pray for daily bread. Pray for the supply of the Spirit of Jesus and, and get filled. Don't be drunk with wine, it says, but be continuously filled with the Spirit. And eventually it's going to overflow. And when it overflows, it's not a strain. It's not a struggle. I'm overflowing at the moment. It's not a struggle. It's not a struggle to come down here and say, oh, it's another Thursday night. Oh. <laughs> oh, I've got to do another teaching. Oh, I'm so tired. Oh, I'm going to do it. <laughs> It's not a struggle. It's easy. That's grace. If you have to struggle, it's not grace. It's works. Grace is you're just graceful. It's just effortless. Look at the birds and how they fly. There's there's just grace there. They're not trying. They're not putting forth all of this effort to stay up there, they just flap their wings. Or in some cases, they just soar. Something greater than them is holding them up. And that's a lot different than trying to flap your wings and <laughs> try to make something happen. Well, that's for those who are mature. What a great incentive to grow spiritually. So this can be your life. This should be normal. This should be your normal everyday life. Overflowing. Where's the joy? Where's the peace? Where's the love? It's not overflowing in many people. It can be. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But what has to happen is, he must increase, but I must decrease. With less of me, there is more of him. And with more of him, there's an overflow. As soon as I get in the way, then it, it blocks everything. So the key thing is to get out of the way. And I think that's the essence of spiritual maturity, just learning to let go, get out of the way, and let God do in you and through you what he wants to do. A lot of times we sabotage our own spiritual growth and maturity. We get this idea of false humility. Well, who am I? And, and what will people think? And that blocks the flow. So when you're spiritually mature, you don't care about that. You don't worry about that. You're not afraid to look foolish. You're not afraid to be out of bounds with some people. You're not afraid of offending certain people. Jesus offended all the religious people. So, 
This is for those who are perfect, those who are mature, is what it means. Paul says, we speak this hidden wisdom. Now this wisdom, he says, is hidden in a mystery. It's a mystery. Verse 7, he says, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Well, all the mysteries of God, the only thing a mystery in Scripture means, it means it is a, it is a truth that cannot be learned, it must be revealed. That's the only thing a mystery is. A mystery is that truth that only the Holy Spirit can reveal. It doesn't mean mystery in the sense that you can't know what it is. It doesn't mean mystery in the sense that you'll never be able to figure it out, or only some people can figure it out, but you can't. It's an open secret. Hidden in a mystery the hidden wisdom, hidden meaning that if you seek it, you will find it, but it's hidden. doesn't mean you can't find it, just means it's hidden. And if something is hidden, Jesus says, seek, seek, and you will find. Seek the hidden wisdom, and you'll find it. Search for understanding into the mystery of God, you'll get it. But you've got to seek. You've got to ask. You've got to knock. Keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, and it will be open to you. That's the mystery of God. That's the hidden wisdom. We shared some elements of that hidden wisdom last week. So if you weren't here for the message last week or you want to go back and review that, you can get the replay off of our website. It's the hidden wisdom. And it's there. It's right there in the scriptures. I'll give you a good example. All these things that we're talking about right here in Scripture. The Bible has been printed and published more than any other book. Many of us have several copies of the Bible. And if you don't have a printed copy, you can go online and you can look up the Bible. Anytime you want, you can search the Scriptures and find whatever you want to find with your computer. It's all right there. But how many will seek? How many will ask? How many will knock? And how many, even though they search the scriptures, quote unquote, they come to all the wrong conclusions? <laughs> because you see, it's a hidden wisdom. It's right there. But it requires more than just reading and studying, checking out what the concordance and the commentaries say, and then listening to the preachers and the teachers and the Bible scholars, what they say. Because here's the key. This hidden wisdom, the wisdom of God in a mystery, it's in a mystery because it can only be revealed by the Holy Spirit. You can study, you can read, you can do whatever you want to do. But until God reveals this hidden wisdom to you by the Holy Spirit, it is nothing but a dead thing. You will not see it. If you do see it, it's because the Holy Spirit has granted you vision to see it. If you learn anything through the things that I'm teaching, it's only because the Holy Spirit is responding to your search for truth and he is giving you understanding. Because I'll tell you this, there are many people who hear the same things that you hear and they don't get it. It has nothing to do with me. I can teach this to 500 people. 400 people won't get it. Maybe 100 people will glimpse it. Maybe two or three people will have their life transformed by it. Has nothing to do with me. It's the same word. It's the same teaching. It's the same man. It's the same message. But it affects everyone differently. So 
So I'm no more to blame for the 400 people than, that didn't get it than I am to be credited for the 100 people that did, or the 50, or the 3. Because the wisdom and the things that we teach, Paul says, can only be revealed by the Spirit. Verse 10, God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So the key is to understand that the purpose of the Holy Spirit is that we might know what is freely given to us by God. The primary function of the Holy Spirit is, is to give us wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, of Christ. Jesus says when the Comforter comes, he will not speak of himself, but he will testify of me, and he will bring to your remembrance all the things that I have taught. The Holy Spirit is Christ-centered. Have you ever considered that? The Holy Spirit is not giving people visions and dreams and words of prophecy about different things going on in the world that don't have anything to do with Christ. That's not the purpose of the Holy Spirit. These people are speaking out of their head, or they have an impression, or they've got some psychic ability, or maybe they're just filled with a religious spirit. But the Holy Spirit testifies of Jesus. Revelation 19, it says, that the, spirit of, the, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It is the truth concerning Jesus that inspires the prophetic word. So the prophetic word is primarily concerned with the revelation of Christ and revealing to us that great depth of who he is to make us Christ-centered, not self-centered, not centered on the things of this world, not centered on events, not centered on politics, but to be Christ-centered, to help us, to lead us into all truth. And Christ Jesus is the truth that is revealed to us. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit. You say, well, I thought the purpose of the Holy Spirit was to give us spiritual gifts. Well, if you understand those spiritual gifts and how to use them, you will lead people and point people to Christ. Well, I thought the Holy Spirit was supposed to give us revelation into the Scriptures. Well, that's true. And if you allow the Holy Spirit to give you revelation into the Scriptures, Jesus says, these Scriptures testify of me. That's the point. Everything is leading us back to Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit is doing, leading us back to Christ, leading us deeper into Christ. And that's why Paul says to the Ephesians, they're already Christians, they're saved, they're doing pretty good. But to people who are already saved, Paul says, I'm praying that God would grant you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know. And then at the end of his life, Paul says, here's my goal, to know him and the power of his resurrection. I press on toward the goal for the high call of God in Christ, to know him, to know him. The sooner you get your faith centered upon a person and not on a thing, not on a teaching, not on a church, not on a doctrine, but focused on a person, the more quickly you will grow spiritually, you'll find that fulfillment and that abundance that you're looking for. Because you're not going to find it in religion, you will not find it in church, you will not find it in denomination, you won't find it in doctrine, you won't find it in theological studies, you won't even find it in this ministry, you won't find it in this teaching. Until and unless we become Christ-centered in our walk, we'll never fulfill the purpose for which we were created, the purpose for which he calls us into the fellowship of his Son. Well, that's the purpose of the Holy Spirit. That's why we want the Holy Spirit. 
Holy Spirit can lead us and teach us and guide us into all truth. That's where the overflow and the abundance comes from. And so, along with this, as we come to the third and final section, spiritual discernment, spiritual discernment becomes critical. It actually is the difference between seeing or not seeing. You can't teach a blind man how to see. Say, so, well, brother, God's called me to just be in my church and to be a light. I'm going to be a light. I'm going to be an example. I'm going to bloom where I'm planted. And I know all the things that are wrong with church, but this is where God wants me. He wants me to teach these people and show these people and be a light. But Jesus says these religious folk are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, they will both fall into a ditch. You can be a light all you want to. But if a man is blind, he can't see. It doesn't matter if you're a light. You can teach all you want to. It's not going to open his eyes. If teaching could open the eyes of the blind, I would have found out about it in the last 25 years. But in my own experience, I can teach and teach and teach and teach and explain and explain and explain and illustrate and illustrate and illustrate. But if the man is blind, he can't see. What he needs is sight, vision. And only the Holy Spirit can give that. Now, hopefully... God will take something that we are saying and something that we're teaching and, and God will open the eyes of the blind and then they can see. But we must always remember that it's not the teaching, it's not the being the light, it's not the being an example. It's God opening their eyes. lest we think it's something that we can do, it's something that we can persuade. I've stopped persuading people. You either see it or you don't see it. If you don't see it, it's not for a lack of me teaching. Something else is going on. That's why Jesus says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. You either get it or you don't get it. If your heart's in the right place, if you're searching the truth, you'll recognize the truth when you hear it. It will resonate in your spirit. You'll know it. You get your head out of the way for five minutes and listen to your heart, you'll know the truth. You'll see it and you'll hear it. And you'll know it and you'll recognize it. And that's what discernment is all about. These things we speak, verse 13, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, see, here's the problem. It's not the words. It's not the teaching. It's the natural man who does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, and why not? Not because there's something wrong with the teaching, not because we have failed to speak the truth, but because these things are spiritually discerned. They have to be discerned by the Spirit. Verse 15, he who is spiritual, he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So let's look at that spiritual discernment. What's the components? Well, here's what we need. Spirit-filled, spirit-taught, spirit-led walk with God. 
it is not enough to be spirit-filled. The world is full of so-called spirit-filled people who are just as carnal as these Corinthians that Paul is writing to. Have you ever met one of these spirit-filled carnal Christians? That's evidence, first of all, of God's abundant grace, that he has grace on us. He loves us so much that he would fill us with his spirit, even when we are immature and carnal and don't grow. But just being filled with the Spirit is not enough. We have to be taught by the Spirit. Spirit-filled and Spirit-taught in order to be Spirit-led. These are all the components of spiritual discernment. People who are Spirit-filled, Spirit-taught, Spirit-led, they see things differently than the natural man. They see things differently than the carnal man. Does that make sense to you? Spiritual discernment. Natural man can't receive the things of the Spirit. They are foolishness to him because they are spiritually discerned. So what does that mean, the natural man? Well, it's interesting because the word here is, what is it? Su, su, su ki, I can't pronounce it. I practiced it this morning. I listened to the guy say it, and then I repeated it, and I thought I had it memorized. Sukeos or something like that. Sukikos, that's it. Sukikos. Sukikos. We'll say it a hundred times, and then we'll remember it. Sukikos. But it's where we get the word psychic or psychology from it means the mind the mind the natural man trying to figure it out with his brain trying to figure it out with his mind trying to wrap his brain around it as we say the natural man cannot 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 receive the things of the spirit of god they are foolishness to him nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned sukikos the psychic man, the psychological man. Now, your mind is important, but you can't discern spiritual things with your mind. They must be discerned with the spirit. And so Paul says the spiritual man judges all things, has discernment into all things. What is that word? Well, that's pneumatikos. Pneuma means spirit. which is also the same as breathe or air. That's why pneumonia comes from pneuma. Spirit, breathe, lungs. And the implication is the invisible, the spiritual. Those who are born of the Spirit are like the wind, Jesus says. Pneumatikos. So you've got the Suke man and the Numa man. And the Suki man is trying to figure out everything with his psyche, with his mind, with his thoughts, with his logic, his reason. Or with feeling and emotion. Paul says you're not going to get there with that. The spiritual man discerns the things that are of the spirit. Now, that doesn't mean, again, doesn't mean that we can ignore the mind altogether because Paul affirms we have the mind of Christ. And he encourages us in Romans chapter 8 to be spiritually minded, he says, as life and peace. It's not enough just to be spiritual. You've got to be spiritually minded. Then later on in Romans, he says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But that's a different function. Spiritual discernment has to do with your spirit. And those who are spiritual, who see by the spirit, they're filled with the spirit, taught by the spirit, and led by the spirit, they have the capacity to be transformed by the renewing of their mind. Your mind has to be renewed. 
don't ignore your mind. Don't say my mind doesn't matter because it, it's all spiritual. No, it does matter. If you don't take care of your thoughts and take care of your mind, it's your mindset, it's your beliefs, it's your convictions, it's your prejudices. That's what's getting in the way of your spirit. Your spirit is 100% ready, willing, and able to walk with God, to enjoy that abundance. It's not your spirit that's the problem. <laughs> it's between your ears. It's that gray matter. It's that brain of yours, the mind that's not been renewed. We've got the tools and the resources for you to get your mind renewed with scripture meditation. Fill your mind with the word of God and begin to transform your life by transforming your thoughts. Because scripture assumes that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So if you're still struggling, it's not in your spirit that you're struggling, it's in your mind, it's in your thoughts. That's where the doubt and unbelief comes from. It's not a spirit of doubt, it's something in your head that doubts. And when Paul says a spirit of fear, God's not giving us the spirit of fear. He's not talking about a demon called fear running around. He's talking about the thing inside of your head. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but power and love and what? A sound mind. So he says here, we have the mind of Christ. Now he's referring to those who are spiritually mature. We speak wisdom among those who are perfect. We have the mind of Christ. <laughs> but then we'll see next week as he gets into chapter 3, but I could not speak to you as spiritual, but as to carnal. So they were not spiritually minded. They were not, they may have been filled with the Spirit, but they were only partially taught by the Spirit, and they were definitely not being led by the Spirit, as we see in their behavior. The behavior and the problems that Paul addresses in the subsequent chapters of 1 Corinthians demonstrates that they might have been Spirit-filled, they might have even been spirit-taught to a certain degree, but they certainly were not being spirit-led. Because to be spirit-led is to lead us into a Christ-centered existence, not a self-centered existence. And the very characteristic of the carnal is that they are self-centered. So I've just got one takeaway for you tonight, just to keep it simple. Takeaway number one, the work of the cross precedes any work of the Spirit. The work of the cross, and by the work of the cross now you understand what I mean, it's the twofold work of the cross. Jesus already died on the cross for the sins of the world, but there yet remains a cross that we must take up and follow after him daily to be transformed. So that work of the cross, taking up the cross and following after him, that precedes any work of the Spirit. Revelation, wisdom, understanding, spiritual growth, everything is based upon taking up the cross, embracing the cross, and following after Jesus. I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified, Paul says. And that has to be the basis of our existence as well. That has to be lesson number one. And it's actually a fundamental lesson that we never get away from. Mastery of any subject, mastery of any discipline, and discipleship is a discipline because that's where the word discipleship comes from. Those who have submitted themselves to a discipline. And in our case, it is the discipline of the Holy Spirit to be governed by the Holy Spirit. But mastery of any subject means you never get away from the fundamentals. You continue to practice and practice and practice the basics, the fundamentals. And when someone fails to master something, usually it's because they get bored with the fundamentals and they want to go on to something that they think is more advanced. They want to get the, 
super duper ninja tricks and the the super special moves and the advanced training and the advanced teaching. And they get away from the fundamentals. But mastery of any subject, mastery of any topic, and including mastering what it is to follow after Jesus as his disciple, means that we begin with the fundamentals, which Paul says is Jesus Christ and him crucified. And no matter how far we advance in this walk with God, Christ and the cross will always be the basis, the foundation of everything the Holy Spirit is working in our life from now till the end of time. So embrace the cross. And get your focus upon the person of Jesus Christ. Not on the things about him, but on him. 